thank you. Thank you everyone for introducing yourself. And uh, before we kick off over here, I want to tell all of our viewers, as we start discussing our questions and asking our questions, if you think of a really good question to ask us, please write it down. We're going to have a Q&A at the very end. And me as a journalist, I love hard questions. It makes us uncomfortable. Um, so, so please don't hold back. Uh, I'm going to kick this off and I'm going to start with you, Tracy. Um, I assume that on January 1st, you had a very different media plan and creative plan when you had to think of rethink everything on March 1st. And shortly after March 1st, there was the Black Lives Matter protest that followed that. Can, can you tell us what that was like? Yeah, so it's funny. Um, you know, we've been a brand or a company for so many years that is focused on offering priceless experiences to their consumers. And the first thing that, of course, threw us for a loop was that many of the experiences that we had planned for consumers um, were physical and in person. And so how could we quickly pivot that um, into the virtual space. And so the teams very quickly um, started thinking about what can we do now to take our physical experiences, make them virtual, and also honor the contracts that we've you know, put in place with our ambassadors. So we have a ton of ambassadors in the sports area and the culinary area, basically lining up to all of the passions that um, our consumers align to. And so, we pivoted pretty quickly and we started offering these um, virtual experiences where consumers could come. They could learn um, golf from Graham McDowell. They could uh, test, you know, or taste different wines with one of our sommeliers. They could, you know, get a, a cooking lesson with one of our, our chefs. And so that was, I would say, one of the first things that we realized we had to quickly pivot to do because consumers were home. They were bored. They didn't really know what to do in, in this current new life that we were brought into and so that was one area of focus and then another was you know there's a lot of people who came out quite quickly with a, a covid spot and it was all about how um to make people feel comfortable during this time and to say that you know as a brand we're here to support we really thought through what that first message was going to be to consumers and we didn't want to jump the gun we wanted to be authentic in what we were putting out there and so you know some of the first messaging we had was really around contactless because contactless is a technology that many people um might know about but there are so many others that still do not and so we wanted to make sure that people knew that when you went to the grocery store if you didn't feel comfortable handing over cash or or handing even your card to um a clerk you could instead take out your phone double, you know, click and there you go. You've got, you know, a safer way for pay for payment. So the next, you know, thing we did was make sure that our contactless messaging was as strong as possible because we wanted people to actually benefit from the message that we were putting out there. That's that's really interesting. And uh, I'm sure most of our viewers here have seen the the COVID supercut where it's cue the som somber music uh, and, and how they stitched all the commercials and, and made it look the same. Um, and, and it's interesting, you guys actually went to a position where it's just like, here's how we can help you and, 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 and you pivoted towards something uh, that's actually useful. I, I, I wanna shift gears here to Eugene. You're the YouTube creative on the panel and you've obviously seen a lot of different changes with creative testing and messaging in the past six months. Uh, are there any examples or recent innovations that have stood out to you? Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, to Tracy's point there, what, what we saw and what we were hearing from, from brands and agencies was this need and desire to want to act quickly. I think generally in culture, when something happens, um, brands and agencies want to be on top of that and you want to be timely. Um, but at the same time, I think we saw also it takes time to act quickly. So brands and, and agencies that were positioned and had a heritage of, of doing that were able to act and, and kind of get moving. Um, I think in terms of the, the strategies and things like that, it was everybody finding themselves in a similar boat, particularly with COVID where uh, everyone was looking for data, they were trying to find insights about what to do. Um, and as far as an innovation goes, I think you know without getting into NDA territory, just in broad strokes, um, what we were seeing a lot of was really uh, innovative approaches to production um, and creative messaging in, in that regard. You know, you had a lot of uh, brands and agencies that had things on the shelf. They had things that were about to go into uh, kickoff for production. So you had to really think uh, long and hard about how you were going to utilize those assets now, uh, reuse assets that may have, you know, been sitting on the shelf or were considered, you know, 
unusable in some cases and getting really, really creative uh, in terms of that. And I think that, you know, when you talk to creative teams, having those constraints really demands innovation at that point. So you started to see great uses of, um, you know, simple text messages uh, and, and overlays and, and, and graphics in that way, um, reusing different kinds of recuts from, from previous spots and things like that, um, finding ways to tap into people who are at home and think of how that could be used uh, in the messaging and, 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 and such like that. Um, but I would say that that was one of the biggest things was just how that creative production was approached. And then the other part is just from a user perspective, going for you know, the rapid change of pace of people adopting technology um, in a very, very short condensed period of time and shifting to almost you know, th this full on digital uh, consumption, uh, whether that's through connected TVs or, or mobile devices and computers and what have you. So you know, that notion of how to flip into that, that call to action mindset uh, for, for brand building and, and how all of those things relate was also another big part of it. Really good. And is there like one specific example that maybe you could share with the audience that, that stood out to you? Um, I think that from a category perspective, I, 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 would, I would stick there and say that the companies that had products to sell, the, the, the retail CG&E stuff that came out, where um, it was interesting to see how people really, really wanted to be useful and focus on that. So I think that anytime you had a company that was selling goods and trying to figure out how to position themselves as useful and um, you know, for, for people who are in need, uh, that's where I think, you know, on, from my opinion personally, I think that that's uh, where I saw quite a bit of, of really good shifts and things like that. Thank you. And, and, and Jed, on, on your end, uh, everything that you guys do is contextual or that's much of what you guys do. And, and when you're thinking about contextual alignment for a brand today, like uh, what type of sensitive time and, and, and sensitive topics, like can you touch on perhaps like uh, what content makes the most sense to advertise on and what doesn't? Sure, so we actually would be pretty agnostic. For, we wouldn't bring our perspective to, to a question like that. We would bring data and then we'd customize it to the advertiser. So at, every advertiser is different and then within their campaigns, uh, the, the campaigns can be different. They can require different types of content to make the campaign perform best. Uh, you know, we've had to teach our platform some new words. We've all learned like new phrases and words like social distancing and COVID and other things that our platform has had to learn hundreds and hundreds of words across dozens of languages to be able to respond to what an advertiser's demand is. And it doesn't mean we're saying you should not run against these things at all. I, I mentioned I was in the news business for 20 years and I and, uh, certainly think that Hard news is a good backdrop for many brands' uh, campaigns and certainly provides reach. But that doesn't mean all hard news is right for all brands and all campaigns. So you just have to be able to do what a client wants. And if a client says, I don't want hard news versus COVID-related topics, but 10 recipes that are right for a COVID quarantine time or how to stay fit, we might want to want those. So we've seen a lot of requests like that or we've seen simple positivity. Like, can you have a, create positive vibration channels for us, uh, channel lists? And so that, those are the type of questions we're getting. Uh, but we find that uh, every client, every campaign is different. We just have to be able to customize and it's gotten more complicated with so many uh, new, new words and phrases that imply a, uh, sort of a different tenor to, to uh, the content. Very good. And, and, and Tracy, I'm gonna direct this next question to you. Um, you know, how do you stand out when, when there's all these types of ads that are very similar uh, that are running and, and you know, positivity is, is certainly a theme that we saw early on in terms of marketing. Like, how do you stand out? How do you make your brand stand out while also being sensitive to the current climate? Like, do you have any answers for that? And if you do, I'm sure we'll all thank you. Yeah. And, and I'm the media person. I'm not the creative person. So bear with me. But I think that for us, it's always about being authentic. And we are never going to put out a message that doesn't really resonate or, or doesn't make sense coming from us, right? So I think where we focused um, and where I think we could stand out was what we've always owned, which is this notion of we bring you a priceless experience. And so we just leaned hard 
hard on that because we know that we could stand behind it. Um, and then the same goes with contactless, like go getting behind what actually is helpful to consumers. I mean, you never want to be that brand that kind of sits back and doesn't say anything, but when you do say something, make it meaningful and make it actually helpful. Um, so really that's the angle that we've taken. Um, we're never going to be, you know, the biggest vendor, you know, so we're also very cautious about or conscious about how and who we're talking to. So, you know, we're very much, a we target, you know, very well. We focus on the passion points that we've aligned to over the years. Um, and so everyone we're talking to on that level, I think we have better impact against our target audience and maybe not against everybody out there, but that's who we care the most about. And so we're, we're very focused in, in our communication and we don't, you know, veer outside of what is authentic to who we are. Great. And I, I guess let me redirect this now to the, to the creative on the channel. Um, I'm a big fan of six second ads because I, I really do think that they work. Geico uh, first started the trend and then, and then YouTube uh, correctly identified that, that this is something that works. But like in this current climate, like what are we seeing? Like, can, can you share some insight on that, Eugene? Yeah, I think that it it's goes back to, again, what Tracy was saying about the authenticity for the brands. When, when we hear questions about what should we do, where should we go, there is no one size fits all. Um, you know, for, for any brand and uh, even interpreting the data differently for different brands, depending upon where they are and, and finding their authentic voice and how they, what their unique value proposition is for users is, is always really at the crux of whatever it is. When you think about six seconds or, uh, you know, true views and 15s and 30s or even longer form content, it's not really so much a question of this or that. It's thinking about how these things all work together to tell that creative story that you want to tell. And that really hasn't changed. I think, you know, thinking again about the industries, whether it's media, entertainment or consumer goods, it's there's a story to tell and there's a time and a place for each of these different components, depending upon where users are and the signals that they're sending out and, and that, you know, where they need to to find this kind of information. So we have seen you know long form content uh has its place and it will continue to have its place and it will evolve i think back to the point of of thinking about creative production and, and, and modifying 30s and then you know cutting those things down and adapting those assets whether they're for television or social um for youtube it is about it's about that mix and it's about finding that right balance and it's about testing and not being afraid to try new things and i and that's probably another part that came out of this is you know people had to try and test and they had to do new things. Doing the same old stuff wasn't necessarily gonna work, but that doesn't mean you abandon everything. And the core principles of good branding and advertising still matter, they still matter very much. So when, when we hear those questions and when we talk to brands, that's the first thing that we're looking at. You know, how are you going to sequence these things if you're gonna use a combination of different formats? Um, ultimately, again, where do you want people to go? It's one thing to think about the ad and the story, but from a user perspective, what am I gonna be able to do? What are you asking of me? Is, my, is, it, is your intent clear? Um, are you branding? Are you attracting them? Are you getting them into that hook? And using all of these different formats depending upon where they are to tell that story creatively. Very good. And, and, and Jed, I wanna ask you, you know, how have your clients adapted quickly? Like, have you had to shift your strategy to ensure you're updating your brand safety and suitability? Like, can you touch on that? Yeah. Um, so yes, we have. Uh, as I mentioned before, we, we've had to just learn a new vernacular around the reality of what's going on now. And our machine has had to learn that. And then we've had to make recommendations for clients. And clients, so we just have heard you know, tr uh, from both Eugene and Tracy about just how brands have pivoted a lot of their messages to have the right message in this sensitive time. Well, one thing that makes YouTube so such an engaging platform for marketers is you have that one-to-one -one ratio between ad and content for the most part. Certainly you could have uh, s several ads as well, but for the most part, it's one-to-one -one, and that makes the ads so much more engaging. But what that means is if that ad with a sensitive new message is adjacent to content that doesn't work with it and in fact could be detrimental to it uh, because it's a sensitive time, we've really had to be on top of that to make sure our machine can see this and ensure that that sensitive ad that we just learned about a few weeks before because the creatives just changed 
is opposite content that not only works for targeting and performance, but also aligns with that new sensitive creative message. And it's, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. Everyone looks at it differently and you don't know uh, how, how marketers or how consumers will react. So you just have to ensure that you're covering all your bases and that your technology just understands that link uh, really in a new sensitive world. Very good, thank you. Uh, we're, right now we're gonna shift to the Q&A portion from the audience. Uh, and if everyone uh, can please turn on their camera and mics, I'd love to see all the lovely people we're, we're speaking with today. Great. Uh, you know, if, if anyone want, has a question, uh, please jump in and, and, and please make us feel uncomfortable and ask us hard questions. I, it'll, it'll make this all so much more interesting. <laughs> Looks like we actually have one from Muriel I see in the chat. Um, I can, oh, go ahead, Muriel. <laughs> Well, I wasn't sure how the question was going to work. So when I thought about it, I thought I'd put it down. Um, Muriel from Western Union. I head up the global brand and marketing function. Um, so one of the challenges that we have and is trying to separate out the effectiveness of media and the effectiveness of creative. And my question was specifically if, I mean, obviously in an ideal world, you have both together. But very often it's hard to separate and it's hard to know, is the creative pulling the effectiveness or is the media weight pulling the effectiveness? And I wondered whether you have a view, whether you have any suggestions on how to look at this. Um, from your experience, I mean, obviously, I'm assuming, Tracy, this is right at the core of a lot of the work that you are doing. But um, I think that both Gerard and, and Eugene would have some interesting opinions on this too. Yeah, I'll, I'll start first. Um, the way we look at it is we really think about thresholds, right? So at the end of the day, if we're not reaching enough of our target audience, whether that's 60% plus um, is usually a goal. Ideally, it's more like 75% plus um, of our target audience. If we're not hitting that, then we say, you know what? it's better to do a really, really good job against a smaller audience than it is to try to stretch ourselves too thin against a wider audience. So the first thing we would do then is say, if we're trying to invest, sorry, if we're trying to reach this person, let's, let's hone in on who that exactly is, reach them the best that we can. And of course the creative and messaging is a key component of that, but let's not try to reach everybody with, you know, crappy, you know, creative, let's say. So, so I definitely am of the camp that you need really strong creative and then really hone in on your targeting to make the most of your dollars. Uh, yeah, I would, I would jump in and say it's clearly hard to disaggregate those two, the, the creative and the media. And you certainly get there by testing as many A, B, C, D, E, F tests as you can do around that. What I would also say is to, to add the surrounding content to, that, to your tests when you uh, implement those tests. Uh, the content surrounding creative can can affect it 50% the the effectiveness of the ad campaign. So, you know, it, it's a it, it is hard to disaggregate all of this, but testing with the surrounding content, the creative, and the media, and do as many tests as possible, and let the data uh, tell you what the right answer is. Yeah, and I I would add I'm gonna I'm always gonna come down on the side of the strong creative uh, just because that's. <laughs> My background um, and I think that I don't think that people hate advertising I think people hate crappy advertising um, you know and I, and I think that when it's useful and it's entertaining it definitely serves a purpose um, so that is that is critical it has to be strong creative to help drive stronger results um, that said there there's a business side to this too absolutely and the optimization of those messages and making sure that they're reaching the right people at the right time uh, is absolutely critical. So there is a science and it is a combination of that data. Um, you know, we have, and if people are unfamiliar with the ABCDs of YouTube, I can paste that link in, but just thinking about how to attract, how to brand, you know, connect direct people. Like th these are general guidelines and best practices to think about how to shape the creative in an attempt to uh, 
integrate the data and the learnings and how those things come in. And we've also gotten questions just about, you know, like user sentiment and, and, and how people are feeling and, and being able to derive insights from things like, you know, comments and videos and things like that. So there are a lot of different sort of directive things that we can do to help improve that performance of the creative. But I do think, you know, as the others are, are suggesting, like, it is, it's a more and more seamless integration of the data science behind it and just an inspired creative idea and message and story. Thank you. Thank you, Muriel. Uh, I, we have time for one more question. Does anyone have a question that they'd like to ask? Please don't be shy. I had a quick question, why not? Um, when we look at dynamic creative, obviously the optimization component of it uh, is really interesting. Um, and But then when you look at what we're doing today, which is all sort of user identification targeting, that becomes sort of the optimization metric of choice in the industry. H how do you reconcile sort of uh, creative optimization and the, the value that it can drive to, to sort of performance in a campaign against that of sort of uh, user targeting optimization, especially given all everything that we heard about the cookie going away um, and and the fact that sort of user user um, focused optimization is may not necessarily be as impactful in the future based upon the privacy changes that are being made. Um, you know, maybe maybe talk to sort of how you see the industry evolving because of those trends. Before someone answers that, I just want to say, Harry, that's a question that I'm, I've been literally trying to get an answer to for like two years now. And uh, I'm eager to hear this one as well. Um, I, I'll jump in, I'll say this. I think it always goes back to the objective, right? So if I am trying to drive a response and get consumers to sign up for something or actually take an action, then absolutely I think I care more about the performance metrics of that ad unit. And so the, the optimization should happen based off of that. Um, I think if it's more in line with actually what MasterCard is usually um, putting out there, which is a more of a brand message and a, you know, uh, trying to get consumers to love our brand and, and really prefer us, then to me, who I'm reaching is as equally important. So I, I don't have the answer. I think it's a really interesting question, Harry. Um, and I think that that's going to be one that's going to be very hard to balance. Um, for brand advertisers because we use performance metrics as a signal and as an indicator, um, but it's not always what we care most about, which is really reach and, and frequency and effectiveness. So um, yeah, I, I don't have an answer for it. I love that question, but it's to me, it's not, um, I don't wanna give up either. <laughs> I guess I would, I would jump in similarly and say it's, it really is about the right KPI. We've seen so many times where the KPI is used just to justify something somebody wants to do, or we convolute bottom of the funnel KPI and top of the funnel KPI, especially if, if budgets suddenly get tight, and then we look at the top of the funnel KPI with bottom of the funnel <laughs> uh, metrics and wonder why you know, something doesn't work. Um, and attribution windows don't always speak to top of the funnel. Uh, some things can take you know, years and years and years to, to, to impact an individual, you know, from a brand perspective. So I think it's, it's certainly very challenging, but it's about the right true KPI for that campaign's objectives. Great. Um, I believe we may have time for one more question. Uh, if not, someone please let me know and, and uh, that, that, would, that would conclude our panel today. Uh, I think that, that 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 about does it. Um, thank you, everyone, for 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 joining us today. And uh, I'm not sure if I hand this off to to, to Leo or not, but I did enjoy my conversation with Eugene, Jeb, and Tracy. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, George. Thanks, thank you, everybody. Thank you. Be well. Thank you. Bye.